more than you think that you need, and when possible, prepare enough to redo in case the first time you don't succeed. So when possible, I like to follow this kind of like two plus extra rule of thumb, where I'll prepare enough to do an experiment or load a sample two times. Um, so to redo it um, and to add a little bit of extra, because you're always going to lose some sample on your pipette tips or on your the walls of your tube, etc. And so this applies as well when you're just preparing a single sample, you always need to make sure that you're accounting for that volume loss. And so I wanna tell talk a little bit about some ways that we can avoid this volume loss as well as ways that we can prepare our experiments knowing that we're going to lose a little bit of that volume taking that into account um, as well as other ways that we can take into account having extra samples so that if something goes wrong we can go back um, we don't have to go all the way back but we can go back to an earlier time point um, and save us some time and that sort of thing so a bunch of practical um, tips and tricks and things so let's dive in some sample loss is inevitable. You can't get around it, but you can minimize the loss. So then one of the main causes of sample loss is going to be the liquid actually sticking to your tubes or to your pipettes, et cetera. And therefore you're losing the volume when then you go and you discard that pipette tip and now you've lost a bunch of your liquid or it's on the surface of the tubes and now it's sticking to the tubes and it's not in the bottom where you're trying to pipette things out of. And so how can you get around this? One is by giving the tubes a quick pulse spin before you go and you use them or before you go and you store them. This is going to help in a couple of ways. One is that you're minimizing the surface area to volume ratio. That's going to reduce the amount of liquid in contact with the surfaces. So there's less that is in contact with the walls of the tube. So less potential opportunities for sticking to occur. It's also if your sample is prone to evaporation, so it's like volatile, then what by reducing the surface area, you expose less of it to air, and therefore you're going to lose less to evaporation. You can also avoid evaporation loss by trying to avoid how much you're like opening and closing the vials and things like this. But often we're not dealing with very volatile solutions in biochemistry, thankfully. So we're gonna deal more with the stickiness issue. And by pulling the liquid down to the bottom of the tube, well, now all your liquid's collected there. And so you can pipette out of the bottom and not be like, where's my sample? And it's stuck on the side of the tubes. Um, and so hopefully by spinning it down, you can um, draw it off the sides of the tubes, but not always. It's really sticky. You also wanna avoid sticking to the sides or the inside of your pipette tips. To avoid sticking to the outside of the pipette tips, you want a pipette with the tip of the pipette just below the surface of the liquid. If you stick your pipette all the way deep inside of there, now what's going to happen is you're going to get a bunch of liquid stuck on the outside of your pipette tip, which is not what you want. To avoid it sticking inside the pipette tip, here you want to pipette slowly, um, especially when you're like drawing your thumb off. What can happen is if you kind of release your thumb too quickly, you can get kind of um, blowback. So it kind of like the liquid kind of sucks up the two, sucks up the pipette tip and it'll end up with drops like stuck on the inside of the pipette tip high up. Not only are you losing sample, but then it could also get in contact with the plunger type thing um, and cause cross contamination of your samples. So pipette slowly with a tip just below the surface. If you have really sticky samples or if you have really precious samples or small amounts of things, you can use low binding tips and tubes. So they have like low protein binding and low DNA or low RNA binding tips and tubes um, that can be helpful for various purposes. There are, so those are ways that you can avoid, like minimize how much sticks onto the surfaces, but you can never completely, completely um, eliminate it. And so instead, what you want to do is you want to try to minimize the number of transfers you have to make and avoid pipetting small volumes. So the fewer liquid transfers you have to make, the less opportunities there are for you to lose sample, because remember, every time you're transferring liquid, you're going to be losing a little. In terms of pipetting small volumes, well, if you think about how much you're losing each time, even if you were to lose the same drop amount, like the same size drop each time you go to pipette, but that's the true for each time you pipette, no matter what volume. Well, if you're pipetting a small volume, that's that one little drop can be a big proportion of your sample, whereas if you're pipetting a larger volume, then it's less of an issue. 
So it, what we can do is we can try to avoid pipetting these small volumes. And at the same time, we can minimize liquid transfers by preparing master mixes when possible. So a master mix is basically where you make um, a mixture with all the components that are shared between different reactions. And then you just add that master mix to all of your individual samples. So for example, if I was doing this RNA labeling reaction, I would prepare a mixture with my buffer and my um, ATP and my water and all of this stuff. And then I would make enough of it to do more reactions than I actually had to do. And then I would add the master mix to each of the samples. I'm gonna have more master mixes in another post but this would then allow me to, instead of having to pipette like one microliter and two microliters, a lot of times when you're working with enzyme reactions, you might have things like 0.5 microliters per reaction, which is a really small volume to, um, to pipette out. And then you can have a lot of inconsistencies in your pipetting as well as sample loss things. And so what you want to do is you want to make a master mix and then add that master mix to all of your samples. You can also minimize the volume that you're going to have to load by diluting your samples first. Um, so this can involve like a serial dilution where basically you do something like dilute by half, by half, by half. Um, if you have a high concentration sample, instead of pipe, trying to pipe head out like 0.25 microliters, go ahead and dilute that. So if you were to say dilute that tenfold, so you would make that 2.5, um, so you'd be dilute so that you make it so that you would add 2.5 microliters instead of 0.25, well, now that's going to be a lot less of an issue when we talk about the accuracy of the pipetting and the proportion that we're going to lose or gain um, based on when we're pipetting. But as I said, you're always, always, always going to lose some stuff. And so you want to prepare extra to account for it. What I like to do when possible is prepare enough to redo it if I don't succeed the first time. So if there was some problem with the experiment, um, there was some problem with the sample loading, maybe I want to go run my SDS page gel and my sample, um, there was a problem with the gel box and so the gel didn't run right or there was a problem with the sample loading and so the well didn't load right or I ran a Western blot and then realized I needed to do a gel as well, a normal gel as well. So there are various times when you might find yourself in a position where you wish you had enough to redo something. And so if you have enough in the beginning to make enough to do it twice, um, you want to prepare enough to do it twice. So for example, for that SDS page gel, what I often do is I prepare enough samples so that I could load two lanes worth. And this time, if I, I hopefully only need to load one lane worth, but if I need to redo it, now I have a the whole a whole extra worth in the in the storage tube. And I don't just have a whole extra worth. I calculate more than I think I would need. So for example, if I want to load 15 microliters per gel, I might prepare 36 microliters of my sample. And that way I have a 15 for the first time, 15 if I have to redo it, and then six extra in case to account for the, the loss from various um, transfer steps, as well as during the heat step of that sample, you're going to have to worry about evaporation. So by preparing using this kind of like two plus extra rule of thumb, I'm able to prepare enough sample to actually do the experiment twice, accounting for the sample loss. Of course, whether or not you can do this kind of thing is going to depend on things like how expensive or available those components are. So if you have a lot of your protein sample, it's not a big deal to go ahead and make two, two and a half um, volumes worth. But if it's a very precious sample, you might not have enough. So you want to take these things into account when you're figuring out how much extra you need to prepare for. Even if you don't have enough to do that, like two plus extra, you still want to have enough to do at least the one with taking into account the volume loss. And so how much extra you need to make is going to depend on things like how big your total volume is, um, how sticky or viscous your sample is. Remember, the more viscous, the more sticky it is, the more it's going to stick to your tubes and go stick to your pipette tips. Um, 
and how many pipetting steps you have. So remember, we try to minimize those steps, but because every step we're going to lose some, um, but sometimes these pipetting steps are inevitable, like those procedures where it tells you to prepare no master mixes, like make it, um, pipette everything in the specific order individually, and then you have a bazillion pipetting steps with small volumes and you can't avoid it. Um, so take that into account when you're figuring out how much you need to prepare. Um, and then, of course, how expensive or precious the components are. Speaking of those components, one of the places that this comes into play is if you're doing some sort of like recombinant protein expression, where basically you're getting cells to make a protein for you, and then you're going to purify the protein out. When you do this, you often like harvest cell pellets. So you basically grow these cells, um, have them make your protein um, and then harvest the cells. So you kind of like spin down the cells, remove the media, so the food they were growing in. And now you have the cell pellet. And then when you're ready, what you're gonna do is you're gonna break open those cells and purify out the protein. Now protein purification usually involves a lot of steps and there are a lot of places where things can go wrong. And so you want to always, if possible, have a backup. Um, and so what I like to do is I like to express and save extra backup pellets. And then if I go to purify one pellet, um, I will make sure that I've, I have already like made another preparation, another pellet in the storage in case something happens during this purification run. I can just go back to, the, to a pellet and not have to go back to actually expressing the protein. So the first time I'm expressing something, maybe if I'm planning on purifying one liter's worth, I might grow two liters worth. This time, this way I have one pellet I can work with and then I have a backup. And then if I were to go, um, once I purified one pellet, now I only have one left. And so then I'll express another one. So I always have a backup in the freezer in case something happens. I don't have to go and wait those multiple weeks that it takes in order to do things like grow up the back made um, for insect cell expression and then express the protein and then all of this stuff. Um, I don't want to wait, so I'll keep pellets in, in the storage. Um, and in order to keep track of what I have, um, I keep like a protein invent construct inventory where I keep track of what pellets I have. Um, and then when I go and I use a pellet, I make note of that so I know I don't have that pellet anymore and I need to express, um, express more and so that I always have a pellet in the backup. If you're doing mammalian cell closure type stuff, um, you want to seed and collect extra dishes or plates um, so that you have extra, both in terms of, say you're doing some sort of treatment, you might want to, I mean, you're seeding a number of plates. So basically you stick the cells, the same number of cells on all these different plates to allow them to grow. And then you're gonna treat them um, with some compound and see what happens. You want to, before you treat them with the compound, what I often do is you want to like make more plates than you think you'll need in case something happens to one of the plates. Um, say it gets contaminated or something, or maybe it just doesn't grow well. Um, some of it peels off. You basically want to have extra and so that you have backup without having to go and restart all of that seeding and all of that experiments. And then when you go to the treatment, say you want to do your experiment in triplicate, maybe you prepare four plates in that case, in that case, in case one of them um, has an issue, you have an extra plate that you can go back to. So always, 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 when you, when possible, keep, um, make extra, do these steps in the early on in the process where you have something you can go back to, rather than have to go back to the very, very beginning, rather than have to grow up a new cell stock and now have to worry about, okay, well, if I want to make, um, if I have to redo this one drug I tested, well, well now it's going to be under different conditions than when I did all the other drugs and have to use more controls, the samples aren't going to be collected at the same time, and things like this. So, you want to make it so that you have extras that are all in the same um, in the same collection time and things like this. And so by, by thinking ahead and preparing extra, you are able to do that. So you want to give those tubes a quick spin to draw down the liquid off the walls, prevent evaporation, minimize the amount of surface area to air and surface area to tube wall so that you minimize the amount of sticking to the tubes. Minimize the amount of sticking to the pipette tips by pipetting slowly from just below the surface of the liquid and minimize the amount of liquid transfers you have to do um, as well as the side make try to pipette larger volumes so any sort of
sample loss as well as sample gain because if you have stuff stuck on the outside of your tip, well, now that and then it goes and you stick it in your other tube, you're going to actually have an increase <laughs> instead of a loss. Um, so you're going to lose more from the one tube, but then gain it more in the other tube. So you're going to get inaccurate measurements. So for both of those issues, try pipetting. Avoid pipetting smaller volumes, which you can do by diluting and making, making master mixes. In addition to the loss from sticking and things like this, they're going to be lost due to experimental errors and due to things outside of your control, um, biological variation and things like this that are going to make it so that some of your samples might not work too well and you're going to have to redo them. Um, and so in all these situations, preparing extra is going to help you out. Um, and so think ahead when you're planning your experiments and make it so that You'll make your life easier in the future just in case. Hopefully you won't need that extra, but in case you do, you want to have it. So hope this helps you plan out your experiments, um, avoid sample loss, and minimize it and um, get around it if possible, as well as work with it if you have to.